long time no see there again. Uh, this is crooked. Let me see how I fix that. Uh, how do I make it not crooked? What's that? <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Okay, so, um, I have no makeup on because I'm broke and I can't buy makeup remover and my skin looks really good so I don't want to put makeup on and knowing that I have no makeup remover and can't take it off and it's gonna fuck up what's going on here right and uh, also my hair is damp because um, to be honest I haven't put out a book club video in so long disgustingly long so I was like, fuck the vanity. I don't need to look good. I just need to share the story. You know what I mean? So we got on my friend's t-shirt, got the damp hair, no makeup, and we're just gonna like talk. Cause I've missed you guys and I haven't made a video in a really long time. And especially a book club video and that's like long overdue. We're back. It's on and popping. Brother, sir, sister, ma'am. Hey. Uh, <laughs> that was just a nice little intro because today we're talking about sexual humor, basically. So today's chapter is chapter 11 and it's called Heat, Retrieving the Sacred Sexuality. I know I've been gone for freaking forever, so as we come back to our journey of healing, this is actually a pretty opportune time for some lightness. <laughs> This chapter is all about sex and laughter and the healing that comes from shared bliss and pleasure. Today we introduce the Dirty Goddess. As I'm sure her name alone brings up many presumptions and connotations in the mind, let me read this little section from Estes in the chapter which sets the story straight from the beginning. The very idea of sexuality is sacred, and more specifically obscenity as an aspect of sacred sexuality is vital to the wildish nature. There were goddesses of obscenity in the ancient woman's cultures, so called for their innocent yet wily lewdness. However, language, in English at least, makes it very difficult to understand the obscene goddess in any way other than a vulgar one. Here's what the word obscene and other related words mean. From these meanings, I think you can see why this aspect of old goddess worship is pushed underground. Dirt, Middle English. Drit, probably Icelandic. Excrement, it has been intended to include filth, generally soil, dust, etc., and obscenity of any kind, especially language. Dirty word, an obscene word also currently used for something that has become socially or politically unpopular or suspect, often through unmerited criticism and denigration or from being out of line with current trends. Obscene, from Old Hebrew, ob means wizard, sorceress. As we see from the definition of those words, it's no surprise that the dirty goddesses natural sexuality and obscenity and dirtiness has begun to take a connotation of negativity in society. That is just another weapon to use against its strong healing power, just like we see in any other healing powers. Because deep-seated laughter heals deep-seated wounds, the obscenity of the dirty goddesses stories create the deepest of laughs, which allow a woman to be free to feel. Estes explains in the book laughter as healing the best. To laugh, you have to be able to exhale and take another breath in quick succession. We know from kinesiology and various other body therapies, such as Hakomi, that to take a breath causes one to feel one's emotions that when we wish not to feel, we hold our breath instead. In laughter, a woman breathes fully. And when she does, she may begin to feel unsanctioned feelings. And what could these feelings be? Well, they turn out not to be feelings so much as relief and remedies for feelings. 
often causing the release of stopped up tears or the reclamation of forgotten memories or the bursting of chains on the sensual personality. It became clear to me that the importance of these old goddesses of obscenity was demonstrated by their ability to loosen what was tight, to lift gloom, to bring the body into a kind of humor that belongs not to the intellect, but to the body itself, and to keep the passages clear. Okay, so this chapter is actually one of the shortest in the book, one of, there's a few that are shorter. Um, for me sharing this with you guys, there is actually three stories in this chapter, but not very much like talking and analyzing of the stories. Because as Esty said, they're meant to be felt in the body, not explained with the mind. They're understood on a different level than other types of healing. The point of these stories that I wanted to get across to you guys before I begin is really relation. The point is to relate to something that's not so of this world. To connect a woman to another woman or women in a way that can't be described with words. And I find it quite funny and interesting that something deemed so negative, dirty, and obscene would truly be so inexplicably mysterious to anyone outside of a woman. So the first story is Baobo, the belly goddess. The earth mother, Demeter, had a beautiful daughter called Persephone who was playing out in the meadow one day. Persephone came upon one particularly lovely bloom and reached out her fingers to cup its lovely face. Suddenly the ground began to shake and a giant zigzag ripped across the land. Up from deep within the earth charged Hades, the god of the underworld. He stood tall and mighty in a black chariot driven by four horses the color of ghosts. Hades seized Persephone into his chariot, her veils and sandals flying. Down, down, down into the earth he reined his horses. Persephone's screams grew more and more faint as the rift in the earth healed over as though nothing had ever happened. The voice of the maiden crying out echoed through the stones and the mountains, bubbled up in a watery cry from underneath the sea. Demeter heard the stones cry out. She heard the watery crying. And then over all the land came an eerie silence and the smell of crushed flowers. And tearing her wreath from her immortal hair and unfurling down from each shoulder her dark veils, Demeter flew out over the land like a giant bird, searching for, calling for her daughter. That night, an old crone at the edge of a cave remarked to her sisters that she had heard three cries that day. One, a youthful voice crying out in terror, and another calling plaintively, and a third, that of a mother weeping. Persephone was nowhere to be found, and so began Demeter's crazed and months-long searching for her beloved child. Demeter raged. She wept. She screamed. She asked after, searched every land formation underneath, inside, and atop, begged mercy, begged death, but no matter what, she could not find her heart child. So she who made everything grow in perpetuity cursed all the fertile fields of the world screaming in her in her grief die 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 because of demeter's curse no child could be born no wheat could rise for bread no flowers for feasts no bows for the dead everything lay withered and sucked at parched earth or dry breasts demeter herself no longer bathed her robes were mud drenched her hair hung in dreadlocks even though the pain in her heart was staggering, she would not surrender. After many askings, pleadings, and episodes all leading to nothing, she finally slumped down at the side of a well in a village where she was unknown. And as she leaned her aching body against the cool stone of the well, along came a woman, or rather a sort of woman. And this woman danced up to Demeter wiggling her hips in a way suggesting sexual intercourse and shaking her breasts in the, her little dance. And when Demeter saw her, she could not help but smile, just a little. The dancing female was very magical indeed, for she had no head whatsoever, and her nipples were her eyes and her vulva was her mouth. 
It was through this lovely mouth that she began to regale Demeter with some nice, juicy jokes. Demeter began to smile and then chuckled and then gave a full belly laugh. And together, the two women laughed, the little belly goddess Balbo and the powerful mother earth goddess Demeter. And it was just this laughing that drew Demeter out of her depression, gave her the energy to continue her search for her daughter, which with the help of Balbo and the crone Hecate and the sun Helios was ultimately successful. Persephone was restored to her mother again. The world, the land, and the bellies of women thrived again. The description of Balbo in the story can create in a average Westerner's mind and point of view a very sexual, very obscene, very dirty view. Estes explains in the book how we must see past the sexual nature of our body and the dirty connotations that society likes to throw on it and label it with and see the sacred beauty and healing that is us. In the book, Estes says, I've always loved this little Balbo more than any other goddess in Greek mythology, perhaps better than any figure, period. She is no doubt drawn from the Neolithic belly goddess who are mysterious figures with no heads and sometimes no feet and no arms. It is paltry to say that they are fertility figures, for they are far more than that. They are talismans of women talk. You know, the kind of talk that women would never, ever, never say in front of a man unless it was some unusual circumstance. That kind of talk. These little figures represent sensibilities and expressions unique in all of the world. The breasts and what is felt within those sensitive creatures. The lips of the vulva wherein a woman feels sensations that others may imagine but only she knows. And the belly laugh being one of the best medicines a woman can possess. Sometimes it's hard to get men to go away so women can just be alone with each other. I just know that in ancient times, women encouraged men to go away on fishing trips. This was just a ruse used by women since time immemorial to make men leave for just a little while so a woman can either be by herself or be with other women. Women desire to live in a solely female atmosphere from time to time, whether in solitude by themselves or with others. This is a natural feminine cycle. Male energy is nice. It's more than nice. It's sumptuous. It's grand. But sometimes it's a little bit too much like Godiva chocolates. We yearn for some clean cold rice for a few days and a clear hot broth to clear the palate. And we must do this from time to time. The Balbo teaches the value of a good, dirty, sexual laugh that gets the belly quaking and rolling with laughter that heals the whole body and can heal the deepest of rages. Something that my mother has always raised me on is that if you meet another woman who, for whatever reason, can't seem to have female friends, there's something wrong. Females need each other. Oftentimes, it's, it's a lot more common that you find like men as they get older that don't have so many guy friends. Although I think men need each other just as much, but I think it's just more common for them to do that. Women need other women and we need alone time. It's like both of those things are just necessary. Spending too much time with the love of my life can get stressful if I don't have any type of feminine energy to add to that or just like chill with every once in a while. I think it's such an important reminder that having feminine energy is so important, but also connecting with each other on those levels, those dirty, obscene levels that are seen as so like negative and not worthy of the world and like society says is so wrong. Connecting with each other on those levels is doubly important, extremely important. Another thing that I feel like I've always like kind of like thought is like when you make friends with someone you're not really friends with them until they share something embarrassing sexual about themselves or some sexual story or something like that you know like until you know their relationship drama you don't really know them you know what I mean and I feel like that's just true of women like maybe maybe men don't feel that way but I definitely think that's true of women we have to connect on those 
levels and it's it's because it's like sex is something that is unable to really be described in words but that we all have the same experience with kind of so we can understand each other get what i mean now just as one final note about the baobo there is another aspect to her that's just so mysterious and inexplicable but that women understand because we know it and we feel it estes talks about this in the book she says to see through the nipples is certainly a sensory attribute the nipples are psychic organs, responsive to temperature, fear, anger, noise. They are sensing organs as much as the eyes and the head. And as for speaking from the vulva, it is symbolically speaking from the prime materia, the most basic, most honest level of truth, the vital os. What else is there to say but that Baobo speaks from the mother load? the deep mind, literally the depths. So now we move on to another story. This story, I don't know, this story and the other story are probably my two favorite. These stories are freaking funny. And they're funny in a way that's just like, so simple and easy and you can't really explain why it's so funny, but like, you gonna laugh, okay. So, <laughs> this story is called Coyote Dick. I'm gonna give a little prelude to the story, which is what um, Estes added in. It's just like an explanation of how she got this story, basically. I think the jokes that Baobo told to Demeter were women's jokes about those beautifully shaped transmitters and receivers, genitalia. If so, perhaps Baobo told Demeter a story like this one, which I heard a few years back from an old trailer park manager down in Nogales. His name was Old Red and he claimed native blood. He was not wearing his teeth and hadn't shaved in a couple of days. His nice old wife, Willow Dean, had a pretty but battered face. Her nose, she told me, had once been broken in a bar fight. They owned three Cadillacs, none of which were ran. She had a Chihuahua dog, that she kept in a playpen in the kitchen. He was the kind of man who wore his hat while sitting on the toilet. I was researching stories and had pulled my little Napanese trailer onto their grounds. So, do you know any stories about these parts? I began, meaning the land and the environment. Old Red looked at his wife real sly and with a rubbery smile and provoking her, he sneered, I'm gonna tell her about Coyote Dick. Red, don't tell her that story. Red, don't you tell her. I'm gonna tell her about Coyote Dick anyway, asserted old Red. Willow Dean put her head in her hands and spoke to the table. Don't tell her that story, Red, I mean it. Willow Dean sat sideways in her chair, her hands across her eyes like she had just gone blind. This is what old Red told me. He said he heard this story from a Navajo who heard it from a Mexican who heard it from a Hopi. Once upon a time there was Coyote Dick and he was both the smartest and the dumbest creature you could ever hope to meet. He was always hungry for something and always playing tricks on people to get what he wanted and in any other time he was always sleeping. Well one day while Coyote Dick was sleeping his penis got really bored and decided to leave Coyote and have an adventure all on its own. So the penis detached itself from Coyote Dick and ran down the road. Actually, it hopped down the road having just one leg and all. So it hopped and hopped and it was having a good old time and it hopped off the road and out into the woods where, oh no, it hopped right into a grove of stinging needles. Ouch, it cried. Ow, 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 it screeched. Help, help. The sound of all this crying woke Coyote Dick, and when he reached down to start his heart with the accustomed crank, it was gone. Coyote Dick ran down the road, holding himself between the legs, and finally came upon his penis in the worst trouble you can ever imagine. Gently, Coyote Dick lifted his adventurous penis out of the nettles patted him and smoothed him down and put him back where he belonged. Old Red laughed like a maniac, coughing fit, eyes bulging and all. 
And that's the story of old Coyote Dick. Willow Dean admonished him. You forgot to tell her the ending. What ending? I already told her the ending, grumbled Old Red. You forgot to tell her the real ending of the story, you old tank of gas. Well, if you remember it so well, you tell her. The doorbell rang and he rose up from his creaky chair. Willow Dean looked at me straight and her eyes sparkled. The end of the story is the moral. And at that moment, Baobo took hold of Willow Dean for she began to laugh and giggle and guffaw and then finally laugh a belly laugh so long and with tears even that it took her two minutes to say these last two sentences. What with repeating each word two or three times between gasps. The moral is that those nettles, even once Coyote Dick got out of them, made his cock itch like crazy forever after. And that's why men are always sliding up to women and wanting to rub up against them with that I'm so itchy look in their eyes. You know, that universal cock has been itching ever since the first time it ran away. <laughs> See, these dirty, obscene, like, sexual laughs are really different than any other kind of laugh. They hit you different. They hit you deep in a way that you can't even explain. Like, an instinctual form of pleasure. Therefore, it's like a version of sexuality. Estes explains this in the book. She says, in the sacred, the obscene, the sexual, there is always a wild laugh waiting. A short passage of silent laughter, a crone nasty laughter, or the wheeze that is a laugh. Or the laugh that is wild and animal, or the trill that is like a run on the musical scale. Laughter is a hidden side of women's sexuality. It is physical, elemental, passionate, vitalizing, and therefore arousing. It is a kind of sexuality that does not have one goal, as does genital arousal. It is a kind of sexuality of joy, just for the moment, a true sensual love that flies free and lives and dies and lives again on its own energy. It is sacred because it is so healing. It is sensual for it awakens the body and the emotions. It is sexual because it is exciting and causes waves of pleasure. It is not one-dimensional, for laughter is something one shares with oneself as well as many others. It is a woman's wildest sexuality. In the final story, A Trip to Rwanda, Estes shows us the lasting healing value of laughter. Its ability to permeate itself in our minds and create a structure for healing and strength and truth as time goes on. A Trip to Rwanda. I was about 12 years old and we were at Big Base Lake up in Michigan. After cooking breakfast and lunch for 40 people, all my nice and round female relatives, my mother and my aunts, were lying out in the sun on chaise lounges, sunning themselves, talking and joking. The men were fishing, which meant they were off having a good time cussing and telling their own kinds of stories and laughing. I was playing somewhere near the women. Suddenly, I heard piercing shrieks. Filled with alarm, I raced to where the women were, but they were not crying out in pain. The women were laughing, and my one aunt kept saying over and over again where she could get her breath in between the shrieks, covered their faces, covered their faces. <laughs> and this mysterious sentence would send all of them off into fits of laughter once again. They shrieked, screamed, gulped, and shrieked for some more a long, long time. On one of my aunt's laps lay a magazine. Much later, as all the women dozed in the sun, I slipped the magazine out from under her sleeping hand and lay under the chaise reading it with big eyes. On the page was an anecdote from World War II. It went something like this. General Eisenhower was going to visit his troops in Rwanda. It might have been Borneo, it might have been General MacArthur, the names meant little to me then. <laughs> the governor wanted all the native women to stand by the side of the dirt road and cheer and wave to welcome Eisenhower as he drove by in his jeep. 
The only problem was that the native women never wore any clothes other than a bead of necklaces and sometimes a little thong belt. No, no, that would never do. So the governor called the headman of the tribe and told him the predicament. No worries, said the headman. He would see to it that the women dressed in them for this one time special event. And these the governor and the local missionaries managed to provide. However, on the day of the great parade, and just minutes before Eisenhower was to drive down the long road in his Jeep, it was discovered that while all the native women dutifully wore their skirts, they did not like the blouses and had left them at home. So now all the women were lined up and down both sides of the road, skirted but bare-breasted and with not another stitch on and no underwear at all. Well, the governor had an apoplexy when he heard and he angrily summoned the headman, who assured him that the head woman had conferred with him and had assured him that the women had agreed on a plan to cover their breasts when the general drove by. Are you sure, bellowed the governor. I'm sure, very, very sure, said the headman. Well, there was no time left to argue, and we can only guess at General Eisenhower's reaction as his jeep came chugging by, and women, after bare-breasted women, gracefully lifted up the front of her skirt and covered her face with it. I lay under the chaise, stifling my laughter. It was the silliest story I'd ever heard. It was a wonderful story, a thrilling story, but intuitively, I also knew it was contraband. So I kept it to myself for years and years. And sometimes in the midst of hard times, during tense times, and even before taking tests in college, I would think of the women from Rwanda covering their faces with their skirts and no doubt laughing into them. And I would laugh and feel centered, strong and down to earth. Estes received such a beautiful gift through that story, just as she shares such a beautiful gift with us with all of the stories that she gives us. These stories, these gifts, are like little psychological tools in our brain, little structures in our brain to promote healing and laughter, to go back to at hard times and remember and to trudge on forward with them by our side. And that story specifically was funny as crap, and any funny story that really gets you laughing hard, you're gonna remember really well. So that's like serious healing. That, that, that type of healing is better than NyQuil, man. And laughter, especially sexual laughter, is better medicine than any hospital could ever provide. Finally, Esty shares one last thing in this chapter I wanted to share with you guys. In that sense, sexuality can be fashioned as a medicine for the spirit and is therefore sacred. When sexual laughter is medicine, it is sacred laughter. And whatever causes healing laughter is sacred as well. When laughter helps without doing harm, when laughter height when when laughter helps without doing harm, when laughter lightens, realigns, reorders, reasserts power and strength, this is the laughter that causes health. When the laughter makes people glad they are alive, happy to be here, more conscious of love, heightened with eros, when it lifts their sadness and severs them from anger, that is sacred. When they are made bigger, made better, more generous, more sensitive, that is sacred. In the wild woman archetype, there's much room for the nature of the dirty goddess. In the wild nature, the sacred and the irreverent, the sacred and the sexual, are not separate from one another, but live together like, I suspect, a group of old, old women just waiting down the road for us to drop by. They are there in your psyche, waiting for you to show up, trying out their stories on one another and laughing like dogs. <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. That was definitely a really, really short one, um, but it was great. I personally strongly believe in the power of laughter. One little anecdote that I kept thinking about while I was sharing this um, story, and it's just so interesting. Um, my father has been in and out of the hospital like my whole life. When I was like 14, he was in the hospital for something really, really serious, and we were really, really scared as a family. 
And for some reason, in the midst of all of that, I just couldn't help making jokes. Like, I was just sitting there making so many jokes while everybody was, like, crying and, like, upset. But I was, like, making people laugh. And I was, like, 14 at the time, so I really didn't know what the heck I was doing that for. But I just knew I didn't want to cry. And it was easier to find things funny. Like, everything seemed funny in that moment. And I think back to that a lot in my life because... Um, that day actually a family member of mine said to me that they were really bothered by the fact that i was laughing so much but also not bothered by it they just didn't understand it they were so confused as to why i would be laughing so much when my own father may be passing away you know and they were like why is that and i didn't really have an answer for them but as i think about it now i wonder if like instinctively i just knew that like laughter was healing because my dad lived through that and he talks a lot about how like my jokes that day were really funny and they were making him laugh even though he was going through something so serious and thought he might pass away i don't know just a thought but laugh some more guys never feel bad about laughing make yourself laugh never stop laughing it's healing and it's important okay on that note I loved making this video and hanging out with you guys for a second again because I've missed you. I want to make more videos but I feel at this weird like creative stagnant place that I don't want to complain about but I also kind of don't know how to get past because I don't really know what to make lately. It's like I have a ton of ideas but feel like none of them are that good which as Estes would tell me to do just fucking do them so maybe I will just fucking do them who knows but I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Next one will be soon. Chapter 12 is really long, so that's going to be a lot of work. <sighs> okay, <laughs> love you guys so much. By the way, even though, like, this is taking me forever, I'm never going to, like, quit or, like, give up, okay? So, like, just know that, all right? All right, I'll see you. Bye.